and welcome to the London VCHA Masterclass. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to join us this morning. Uh, all the more remarkable, actually, given what is going on at the moment. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Guy Benson and my background includes a full career in the armed forces uh, as a soldier and an officer in the British Army. For the past six months, I've been employed by the RNOH and I'm one of seven regional leads within the Veterans Covenant Healthcare Alliance team. Today, I am acting as the VCHA facilitator for the London VCHA Masterclass in support of Anna Marie. Uh, more of her later. Uh, before I hand over to the regional lead, I want to just very quickly go through some housekeeping rules, please. Uh, firstly, we are using MS Teams, um, which has got about 20 odd participants at the moment. We used MS Teams because it's more interactive, uh, which is, is slightly better than Zoom. Uh, can I ask everyone to please mute uh, unless they are actually uh, speaking? Uh, and if you've got issues with bandwidth, please turn your video off. Um, can I ask people to keep the chat function to the absolute minimum because it is distracting for, for the speakers? Um, and only questions should be placed in the chat box. Um, and some of the VCH team who are actually online will, will answer some of those questions as they go along. Uh, time is actually tight on the webinar. There is a question and answer session right at the end, uh, assuming that we have time. But the, the reality is that uh, we will be recording, uh, Anna-Marie, um, uh, can we just make sure we've got that recorded? Um, and uh, that will be promulgated within the first sort of week. Um, in terms of um, aim of the presentation, if I can get my screen to know, there you go. Uh, the aim this morning is really to conduct a masterclass in Veterans Covenant Health Healthcare VCHA manifestos number one to eight in order to assist all London trusts reach VCA accreditation by November 22nd, so that's next year. Uh, it is worth noting that we have a broad range of participants and therefore we hope to cover both left and rights of arcs in terms of individual journeys from trusts or organisations for their manifestos. Uh, I hope you enjoy um, the morning. Uh, it's a fun filled packed uh, day um, and Anna Marie has done an awful uh, lot of work to get it uh, on the road. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to uh, the London uh, regional lead. Uh, Anna Marie, over to you. Thanks for that, Guy. Um, so good morning and thanks for joining us today. So this masterclass has been set up uh, just so you can have a better understanding of the BCHA and what it looks like in practice. And it's delivered by those people who've gone through the process or by organisations who can support you. So alongside this masterclass, a supplement um, will also be sent out to everyone, which is more detailed and it's got a lot more information on each manifesto standard. And this will give you more information um, with easy to access resources, case studies and also the contact information and full bio of all the speakers. But on a personal note, having been through the system, both with medical discharge and um, homelessness, I wish that the VCHA was in place when I needed it. But luckily it is here now and it is my hope that with trusts around London signing up to support veterans and their families, there will be less people having to go through what I went through. But I'd now like to hand you over to my boss, Professor Tim Briggs. So Tim was appointed to the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital as a consultant in 1992. He was medical director at the RNOH for 15 years, ensuring a rebuild and was president of the British Orthopaedic Association in 2014. He was appointed as national director for clinical quality and efficiency for the NHS in 2015 and has been asked to lead and roll out the GERFT programme across all surgical and medical specialities within the provider network. In January 2019, he was made National Director of Clinical Improvement for the NHS. Additionally, he is Chair of the VCHA and is the author of the Shavas Report. Professor Briggs was made Commander of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire in the 2018 New Year's Honours List for Services to the Surgical Profession. So, Professor Tim Briggs, over to you, please. So, Anna, very, very good morning to everybody. And Anna, very thanks for that. Kind introduction, a bit embarrassing, I have to say, but what we're going to do is we're driving things, we're driving change in the NHS at pace. And the 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 plight of veterans for me has been a, a real, I've had a real beer in my bonnet around it for a great number of years. But now I think we've got a real opportunity and the time is absolutely right. And we've got the wind in our sails to actually deliver significant change. 
So it's really very nice to be able to just talk to you for 10 minutes. Next slide, please. So just going to do a bit of background overview of the team uh, and we've got a cracking team. And as people will know, if you're going to succeed in life, it's all about it being a team sport. And we've got the team that I think will deliver the progress and then just talk a little bit about rehabilitation. Next slide, please. So why does it matter? Well, you can see on the slide here on the left hand side, people who serve in the armed forces defend the realm, sacrifice some of their civilian freedoms and they walk into danger and sometimes suffer serious injury or death. And the families of um, our, our armed forces play a vital role in that. And therefore, what do we need to do and what morally do we, do we need to do in return for those? And what we've got to make sure we respect them, support them, and they get fair treatment and they know how to access it. Next slide, please. So veterans, uh, as we know, have needs and challenges. You can see them there and I'm not going to read those out. But there is already some really good practice out there um, about how our veterans are managed in the NHS. And what we want to do is share that, um, enhance it and make sure wherever veterans go, they're recognised, they're given fair treatment and high quality treatment that will allow us to deliver the best care for them. And we need to share that best practice between hospitals and also link them into the charities and also make sure that we help them with employment. Next slide, please. So veterans have similar um, uh, health uh, to other members of society or non-veterans, except there are some significant differences around musculoskeletal, cardiovascular, respiratory and clearly mental health. Next slide, please. So where it came from was really the GERF report. And as, as I was going around, I would ask trusts. And as people will know, I've been to every single NHS trust in England at least twice. I would ask them um, as a side thing what they were doing regarding veterans. And I said there was some really great practice out there. But clearly there were also cases where people really didn't understand the needs of veterans. And that's where the Shavas report came, uh, which we published in 2014. And it's been a slow burn since then, but now we've got the real pace and energy to drive it forward at pace. Next one, please. So what did we say in the Shavas report? Well, one, what we wanted to do was to enshrine the armed forces covenant in the NHS, NHS, in the NHS. And as people will know from the Queen's speech, that's now going to be enshrined in law. And I think that's a real positive step. I wanted to make sure we improve the care and rehab, transfer the learning from the Defence Medical Services and the NHS. There's a lot of learning we can do from them and we can provide to the Defence Medical Services. And I wanted to establish a network, a provider trust who really understood the needs of veterans and how we could really um, improve that and enhance it. And initially it focused on MSK because I'm an orthopaedic surgeon, but there's no doubt that the, 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 the findings would apply more widely to other specialties. Next one. So what's our purpose? Simple, to develop, share and drive implementation of best practice that would improve armed forces veterans care, whilst at the same time also raising standards across the NHS for all users. And that is a very important statement. Remember, all veterans are also NHS patients. And if we can exemplar care, we can cascade it into all the patients that access the NHS. So for me, it's a win-win. Next slide, please. We've now built quite a lot of support and consensus across health and defence. I won't go into the, um, the, the, the quotes there, but we're now seen as a real important driver of improving quality and improvement, not just in veterans, but NHS care. And with the VCHA, VCHA, there is a real opportunity to really exemplar and provide better care for our veterans. Next slide, please. So where are we? Well, we started with a workshop in 2017, agreeing what standards would we expect from a trust who is going to exemplify our veteran care. We started with 25 veteran aware hospitals. We now got to 68 and that is definitely uh, the pace is increasing. It's acute provider trust, mental health trusts, ambulance trusts. Uh, so and what we have been asked to think about is also about hospices and what have you. So there is no doubt we want to go into everywhere where veterans attend to make sure we exemplify our best care. Next slide. So I lead the team um, and it's been a privilege uh, to do that. Uh, I never served in the armed forces, but this has all come from my experience working at Stanmore at the ROH, where I'd see a lot of veterans and serving um, personnel over the years. 
uh, some of whom struggled to access the care they required because they didn't know how to do it, and yet they needed the complex services that we could provide at the RNOH. Next slide, please. This is the management team. We've got Alison Beale, who's my senior manager, and Jill Salter, who's the program manager, working really well together. And we've all got one purpose to drive things forward. Next slide, please, Guy, or however. And this is the absolute crucial mix of what we've got. You can see we've got seven regional leads, four of whom have been, who have served in the armed forces, three that haven't, but it gives a great mix. We get, the, we get the understanding of the armed forces, but we also got the understanding of the NHS and how we can blend the two together to give us the outputs that we really need. Next slide. I'm also doing a piece of work looking at rehabilitation, how we make sure that armed forces, when they come out of the NHS, actually exemplar and continue to receive the great care they get, at what, which was at Headley Court, it's now at Stamford Hall, how we maximise that. And so we've got a two-year program. Maisie, you can see, is now a captain uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the army and is a physiotherapist, and Sarah Barker is an OT. So together, we're exemplaring and finding out best practice, and we aim to put that into play uh, as a pilot next year. Next, next slide, please. The regional leads, this is what they're going to do. They're going to focus on the NHS regions to become veteran aware. We want to look and secure all trusts accredited by November 22, and we want at least 100, uh, 101 is what I'd like by November, because that is the age of the cenotaph uh, on Armistice Day this year. We want to support trust and healthcare providers through that process, and the team are there to help, and they are absolutely driven wanting to do that, and we want to make sure we engage with other veteran services and the third sector. But this is not just about getting the tick box that you can see there behind Guy Benton and Anne-Marie. It's about getting the ticks box and delivering. And therefore, what we do, there will be a reaccreditation process of providers in year one and year three. And we'll continue to develop and embed veteran awareness. Next slide, please. Finally, um, I've, as I've said, rehabilitation has been a bee in my bonnet. And we now have planning permission and we're starting to build. It's taken me a lot longer to get it through than I anticipated, but we're building a 55 bedded uh, rehabilitation unit at the ROH, which will have a dedicated four to six bedded veteran rehab unit, which I'm really, really excited about. We'll link it into the national part of the DNRC and we'll link it into other trusts that also provide this, uh, this service. But this is the first dedicated to veterans in the NHS. And what I want to see is I want to see a number of these around the country. And this is why all the work that Sarah Maisie is doing now is so important. So why at RNOH? We have complex cases. We've got a spinal injury unit. We do complex rehabilitation. We've got Murison Centre for amputees, and we major in pain and psychological assessment and treatment. So I think it was really, really opportune. So I think the future is bright. The future for veterans is we have a real opportunity to make a massive difference. So I would like you to support it, become accredited, work with our team, and in the London region with Anna Marie, who will provide a huge amount of support. And I'll be there to help as well, as well as my other regional, the regional group. We're all as a team and I look forward to working with you. So thank you very much. Brilliant. Thanks, boss. So thank you for that, Tim. Um, so I'd now like to introduce Alex from the Ministry of Defence, who will be talking about the Armed Forces Covenant. And Alex is Head of Community Engagement, working for the Army Engagement Team based at Horse Guards at Whitehall. And her main responsibility is the delivery of the Armed Forces Covenant in London. And thank you for taking the time um, to speak to us today, Alex, and over to you. Oh, good morning, everybody. Um, so uh, thank you. Thank you for coming um, along. Um, and what I want to do is kind of go through a bit of a, a whistle stop tour um, of the Armed Forces Covenant, what it is, who it impacts on and um, where we are now um, with it. Um, Professor Timms kind of mentioned about what the Armed Forces Covenant is, as in the you know, it is for our armed forces and personnel. But I think the point I would like to um, to make off of that, sorry, can I have the next slide, please, Anna? What I would like to point at this particular statement um, is that the, the Covenant is there to support those who have served and those families who have supported them. But we need to be aware that it's not about prioritising the armed forces community over all other citizens. It's just acknowledging that in serving, certain commitments and sacrifices have been made. 
um, and we want to make sure that this community does not face a disadvantage. So it's not about advantage, which is a myth that we're trying to dispel um, across across the board. Uh, if I can have the next slide, please. So I want to apologise firstly for this slide um, is, is actually an incorrect slide. It's a, a slide from 2018, but actually um, looking on it, it's a really good comparison slide. So just to go through some of the things that the Covenant has achieved um, since its inception in 2011. Uh, and as you can see there, look at the first bit is uh, 23 million pounds um, has been spent in 2018 on the service pupil premium to ensure that those service children in, in schools um, you know, those are were able to adjust um, within that. Uh, in 2020, it was 24 and a half million. Um, so again, an increase um, of one and a half million. Um, in 2018, we had over 3,000 organisations had signed their commitment to the Armed Forces Covenant and made pledges to support the Armed Forces community. Today, that sits at over 6,000, uh, which is a huge, um, huge amount. Um, mentioned there about the, the numbers of hospitals that have been accredited, um, you know, from 25 now to 68. Um, on top of that, we now have 800 GP practices in England that are accredited as veteran friendly. Um, so as you can see, there is more and more investment into the covenant to support the armed forces community uh, within that. And I will send the upslide, updated slide um, through to you. Next slide, please. So who are our armed forces community? Um, the armed forces community are made up of uh, three sectors. So we have our regular and reserve personnel from all three services. So the Army, the Navy and the uh, Royal Air Force. Um, and that includes all those that serve on a regular basis and all those ser that serve as a reserve. So those that have you know, ordinary civilian daytime jobs, but actually are in one of those services um, as, as a part time um, service. Um, veterans, so anybody, um, the, the, the definition of a veteran is anyone who has served for at least one day as either a regular or a reservist. Um, support will be better provided and a better understanding will be had to staff and um, to their backgrounds and the issues that they may have encountered during their service. Big part of our military community is those families. Uh, the families, the spouses, the civil partners, children's and dependents. Um, and an understanding um, needs to be had of the issues that may be faced by those um, families, not directly employed by the armed forces, uh, not on tour, but actually have different uh, different needs. And we need to understand uh, you know, what, what their um, challenges are and how we better address that. It might be there's not a different outcome, but it could be there's a different pathway for these individuals um, to, to get to where they need to to access that particular help. Um, a serving or ex-serving individual won't always tell you that they're a serving or an ex-service um, individual. Uh, and that's one of the, the drives that we want to kind of go forward and really encourage you to do, and certainly the NHS, um, is to ask the question is, have you ever served? Uh, it's absolutely critical that we can kind of capture that data to where these armed forces um, communities are and actually what their specific needs are um, and certainly in the veterans community because we can't track our veterans. Uh, we're hoping now that with the, the 21 uh, census um, has had the additional question um, to address that. So we're hoping to be in a better place to identify exactly where our veterans are, understand the challenges uh, and then make sure that the resources are put in those correct areas. Next slide please. So why, why should you sign the Armed Forces Covenant? Um, as I've mentioned, we've got over 6,000 organisations, public bodies that have signed their commitment to the Armed Forces Covenant. Each of those um, look at their own internal organisation um, to better understand how they can support the Armed Forces and therefore sign the Armed Forces Covenant. So what, 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 what does it mean for you? Why should you do it? By signing the Armed Forces Covenant, it promotes that you're an Armed Forces friendly organisation, which in turn, we we'll hope that when the armed forces community come to you to, as, as a, a director of services, that actually they'll they'll be honest and say that they are part of that that community. So that that's just really promoting that they're not frightened uh, that your organisation isn't isn't going to understand that they're um, ex armed forces or from a community. It also enables you to seek the support of veterans, young and old, working within the career transition partnership and other associated initiatives. Yet a lot of those um, veterans that leave. The, um, the, the, the services have got exceptional transferable <coughs> skills um, to come into organisations such as yourselves. So it opens up 
um, areas there for you um, to access within that. It also enables you to. Sorry, I've muted there for a moment. And it enables as well um, to look at the employment of service spouses and, and partners through the Forces Families Jobs Initiative. Again, there are a lot of skill sets there with um, with partners and serving spouses that actually could look at you know being employed here within your sector um, to provide again some of that um, experience and expertise that they have within that area. Also enables you to offer a degree of flexibility um, in granting leave for service spouses and partners before and during a partner's deployment. Uh, also um, enables support to your employees who choose to be members of the reserve forces. And we've heard here today that there are a number um, of individuals working in your organisation that are part of the reserve forces. Um, a lot of employers will recognise the fact that their um, you know, the commitment to the armed forces is still there, even though in a part time basis and offer additional leave to be able to undertake training or deployment. Um, and it offers you the opportunity to get involved with your armed forces community um, in a wider perspective, um, you know, which is really positive um, for us uh, to, to come together and work collaboratively. Next slide, please. <laughs> So finally, um, embedding the armed forces covenant into legislation. Um, this is a, a fantastic piece of news. Um, it was first presented into the armed forces bill in February um, of this year, uh, again mentioned in the Queen's speech yesterday. Um, legislation will introduce a new statute duty to have due regard to the principles of the covenant, and this will apply to a specified list of public bodies when they are carrying out specific public functions in the areas of housing, healthcare and education. The bodies and functions in scope are listed in the legislation and will also be explained in accompanying guidance. The Armed Forces Bill um, is going through the committee stage um, within the Commons um, and a select committee has been taking evidence on and conducting scrutiny of the bill. Uh, the first part of the work has now been published um, into a report and I can send a link um, to this through to you. Over the next few months, the bill will have its final stages in the Commons before going off to the Lords. We expect the parliamentary process to play out for most of the rest of the year, expecting royal assent for the bill around autumn time. Once this has been received, uh, we will continue to work on the redrafting um, and the consultation uh, with publication of the statutory guidance expected in early 2022. Um, within that, we will be holding focus groups um, in the middle of June, uh, looking at the, the guidance of that, um, and that's a really interactive session. Um, and I will be reaching out to your organisations um, to take part into those uh, once we have a better understanding of how that is going to have be impacted, um, certainly on the, the health benefits um, of that. And as I've said, it's a bit of a whistle stop tour, um, and I'm happy to take any questions in the box um, or at the end. Thank you. Thanks, for that, Alex. That was brilliant. Um, so now I'd like to introduce Billy. Um, he is the Armed Forces Lead at Guys and St Thomas's. Billy is a veteran, having spent 23 years in the Army, and he is a current reservist. With Guys being the largest trust in the UK, his role is a clear commitment to the Armed Forces community and the VCHA. So thank you for giving up your time today, Billy, and it's over to you. Thank you very much, Anna Marie. Uh, hello to everybody. Uh, currently, just a little bit about me. As Anna Marie said, I just left the, the Armed Forces uh, uh, regulars in October. Uh, after 33 years, I then jumped across to the NHS and I've done uh, the mass fax for the last three months. And the role of Armed Forces Lead in Guys and St Thomas's uh, became available. I applied and, and hence I'm sitting here in front of you today. Uh, I've been given Manifesto 2 uh, for my discussion today uh, and having been seven days in the seat now at Guy's and St Thomas's, uh, I am by no way means uh, the, the be all and end all of Manifesto 2 and, and how to uh, put it across, but certainly from what I've, what I've learned and what I've seen already uh, within Guy's and St Thomas's, uh, we've got a, a sure footing, uh, a foot on the ground now to build on uh, from our silver accreditation and move forward to uh, next slide, please. Uh, Manifesto 2 is the hospital is clearly designated uh, veterans champion, uh, Dyad, which is myself and Sarah Austin, who is the director of integrated and specialist medicine. 
uh, and everything else then that is below her name. Uh, she covers as one of four of the main directors. Uh, she has probably 7,000 people of the 25,000 uh, within the guys in St. Thomas's footprint. Uh, going through manifesto two, then the trust commitment. Uh, the trust commitment to the veterans as will be right away through the manifesto points. Uh, we're looking at, at building a guys in St. Thomas's veterans network, uh, building on that from uh, even the volunteers, the veterans, the reservists, uh, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, who want to come in and help within the trust itself. Uh, we've got a number of reservists, as you can imagine, within the 25k uh, of, of personnel, staff that work for Guys and St Thomas's, and it's harnessing that now, and I'm doing that through different uh, forms of media, setting up a, a veterans network mailbox, etc., to capture the amount of people or capture the the, the forces family uh, within the the, net, uh, the trust itself. Looking again at recruitment as part of our, our pledge, uh, I've talked to the recruitment staff uh, and also um, uh, meeting up with the Step Into Health uh, team to discuss how we can enhance the recruitment, knowing from my own experience itself coming into the NHS, it wasn't a simple process. Uh, so I'm working on that within the organisation. Uh, and reaching out again to the local organisations uh, in uh, selling the armed forces component uh, and encouraging them to join up uh, to assist our veterans reserves and their families. Uh, local communities, I've got links, uh, as Sarah has linked me directly into her executive team, uh, I've got links into the local communities, into uh, the homeless, mental health, et cetera, et cetera, right, of, right away through our network uh, to build and give the support out to the veterans within not only the, the patient base that comes in, but out to the, the actual communities themselves. And as part of the trust commitments, again, is the, the advocate uh, support for the defence and the armed forces, which we'll do and build throughout throughout my, my time here uh, and build on what we've actually uh, achieved in the past. On to services available, uh, as I said, I've been linked in now with all the executives from my, my mere seven days here. I've, I've discussed with various organisations, uh, both inside and outside the trust now to build to build that uh, relationship uh, to get out and, and find our veterans support our veterans, support our reservists in the trust, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, mentoring has been uh, uh, put on my agenda. Billy, you've gone on mute. Don't know where I got to there then. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start again with the services available. Uh, so uh, welfare, uh, reaching out into the, the community itself within Guy's and St Thomas's uh, and finding our uh, both patients and staff who need support. Uh, recruitment, mentoring and ghosting. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, Anybody that reaches into the Guys and St Thomas's uh, recruiting network uh, or into me as the armed forces lead, uh, assigning somebody from that field to mentor them from the, the Guys and St Thomas's staff, and also then if on successful application and finding the job or getting into the job, is ghosting them through their first two to six months, uh, as an example, uh, to make sure that they settle in from. Uh, being in the armed forces itself to come in into an organisation like the NHS. Uh, monthly working groups, uh, setting them back up again, again, steering groups. So we're looking at uh, staff interest in the in the initial bid to get the people and the network built up, uh, where we'll discuss best practice uh, as we go through the, the manifesto points and where we can we can target our efforts for areas that are weak within the trust. Uh, bringing out any lessons learned from the, the various uh, different departments 
uh, within the trust and, and again building on them and how we can uh, enhance them to support both the patients and the staff throughout uh, their, their cycle here. Uh, putting into a uh, forecast of events, uh, selling that. So we're looking now that at doing the Armed Forces Day as a sort of uh, a, a welcome uh, to the Armed Forces lead and, and the Armed Forces Covenant again, uh, reinvigorating that uh, on the 24th of June and then doing the, the 13 bridges again as part of the Armed Forces Day uh, celebrations and, and promotion. Uh, staff training and awareness, there are NHS uh, Veterans Aware training uh, available on uh, share or, or is it the, the intranet. Um, and again, bringing that back in because we're still back. We're not on SharePoint in Guys and St Thomas's. Uh, so it's it's getting that message out, getting it, making sure that the links are are, are workable in the different organisations within the trust itself. And also I identifying the veterans, reservists and families. And what I've done here is I've, I've fed into the, the comms team uh, to get flyers, both for patient facing flyers, for putting on their beds, etc., uh, on admission to guys in St Thomas's, as well as leaflets that they can pick up at reception. Uh, and also flyers, uh, bulletins, screen savers that we can put uh, on our intranet for our staff to know where they can get the support and come and join the veterans network uh, and contribute as much as they can. Outside organisations, uh, signposting uh, our patients through the through their cycle after they leave uh, the guys in St Thomas's bubble uh, into the, the various different organisations. And an example we've got a guy who was a veteran uh, back in the 70s who has just had a stroke and now he's been linked in with SAFA about adjustments to his house. So it's it's different using them different organisations to make sure that we get the best results for our veterans and, and forces. Uh, linking in again to the charities, uh, uh, a massive plethora of charities, uh, not only just in the London area, but uh, uh, throughout the UK uh, and, and making links with them. So things like SAFA, uh, the ABF, the RBL, etc., to make sure that we've got that support network for our veterans out in the communities. Uh, and again, I've done the, the welfare and of course, promoting the Armed Forces Covenant uh, to the organisations that support uh, not only the, the NHS itself, uh, event support. Um, my 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 network as well is is jumping in now. As I said, we're going through the Armed Forces Day uh, cycle now. Event planning, uh, and what guys in St Thomas's are looking at is the Armed Forces Day uh, Reserves Day as well. Uh, the 13 Bridges and Armistice Day are the the main key points on my calendar now. Uh, as my uh, seventh day goes into it. Uh, I'll be populating more. Uh, thank you very much for listening to my uh, uh, quick canter through uh, Manifesto 2 and any questions in the uh, text box or, or to me at the end. Thank you. Thanks for that, Billy. Um, that was a really informative presentation, so thanks for that. Um, I'd now like to introduce Debs. Uh, she's the programme lead for Step Into Health. Uh, she's a veteran having spent 26 years in the army and can speak for the wealth of experience and skills that the armed forces community can bring to the NHS um, as employees. So thank you, Debs, and over to you. Thank you. And I, and I think, can I just say, um, Billy's on his seventh day going into his eighth. What a fantastic example of how quickly members of the armed forces community and jump into brand new roles and be running at speed. Um, and hats off to you, Billy. Thank you. Look forward to meeting you soon. Um, so thank you very much for the introduction to me. Um, and I apologise in advance for any terrier induced background noise I may have. I'm working at home. Um, and, um, and I would also say, uh, incidentally, when I when I left the army and, and tried to find somewhere to live, the blokes in my pub got confused between corporals and colonels. And so I'm often called corporal in the pub. And if you know the army, you'll know what a fantastic achievement getting to corporal is, what a brilliant rank it is. 
And so I kind of take that. And if you come to Malmesbury um, and you're having a cider in my local, please don't um, dob me in and give me away. Um, my, my team comprises me and a programme support officer who's called Natalie Wong. Natalie joined at the same time as me, which is about two months ago. Um, so we're a new team, but I can't be the new girl anymore. Billy gets that. Um, and, um, and what I've got to do over the next sort of year or so as the programme continues is build on the success of what is already a great programme. I've been asked to talk to a, a slide, which I hope is coming up now. Um, and uh, and that really is because it, it sort of links in not just what my programme does, but another programme run by NHS employers. So it's um, the, the reservist programme is run by colleagues, at NHS employers, and that looks specifically at supporting employers um, with the management of their reserves um, personnel. My programme, um, I will go through it in a minute, but it's the Step Into Help programme. It also um, really sums up what Manifesto 3 is all about as well in, in some senses. Um, it's asking you um, to support the UK armed forces as an employer. Um, and if I wanted you to take one point away from this um, and from that manifesto pledge, it would be um, you're asked to either pledge into Step Into Health or into ERS or just do both. It, you know, it's not hard and, and particularly st um, Step Into Health is an enabler. It will help you with your VCHA accreditation. It'll help you with your ERS journey as well. Um, and it's an easy win for you. So before I um, sort of go through this in detail, I'll just briefly outline what Step Into Health is, because you can see on the first bit here, make your, your commitment public, that you've, uh, you're asked to pledge into Step Into Health. So Step Into Health is a recruitment programme for the NHS. It came about um, from a pilot scheme run with Walking with the Wounded um, and the Royal Foundation and Norfolk and Norwich Hospitals in 2015. Um, it then um, became big and was moved to NHS employers to run. Um, and uh, we now have 104 trusts pledged to the to the programme. Um, and, uh, and I'll give you some more facts and figures as we go through. But it is ostensibly um, a recruitment programme. Um, it's one which um, asks um, employers to proactively, I can't even say that, connect with the armed forces community um, and attract them to keep careers in the NHS. We are really focused on the non-clinical careers, a bit more about that in a minute. Um, and um, we're, we're focused on the slightly lower bands um, within Agenda for Change. The, the, non, the non-clinical roles then. Um, we had about 3,960 applications to NHS jobs in the last quarter um, from the armed forces community. Um, and of those, about 3.1% were for the admin and clerical um, and for uh, estates and ancillary roles. Um, and so those are the types of roles that we're really sort of focusing. And that was our, our biggest staff group, if you like. Um, we had 110 job officers in the last quarter, and that means since the rollout of um, the Armed Forces Identifier on NHS jobs, we've had 1,076 members of the Armed Forces community go into roles in the NHS. Um, as you will know, that won't count for everybody. Not everybody uses NHS jobs, um, and, um, and not everybody self-identifies as a member of the Armed Forces. So pledging to step into health, what, what are those pledges? There are five key pledges, and then there are some other enhancing activities which we invite you to sign up to. Um, and they're not difficult, I'll say that again. The first one is to advertise opportunities within the CTP. Um, and CTP, sorry, is the Career Transition Partnership, which is the main resettlement um, organisation for service leavers, of which there are about 15,000 a year. We ask you to have a look at your recruitment practices and remove anything which might not need to be there. So, for example, do your admin and clerical staff, your and states and ancillary staff, your project managers, do they need to have experience in the NHS? Um, and if they don't, then, then don't put it in the application form because it will stop a lot of people from picking up the phone to talk to a recruiting manager um, or even applying. Um, we ask you to pledge to using our candidate management tool. We've got about 1,400 people at the moment um, in that pipeline who have registered an interest in jobs in the NHS. Um, and we're looking at making that process slightly smoother so that it's easier to direct message between um, trusts and, and candidates. We ask you to use our branding where appropriate, and we ask you to give us some contact details. OK, you can all do that. That's dead easy. 
And then on top of that, um, there are enhancing activities which we can support with and normally done in partnership. And that includes um, hosting um, career events, uh, hosting work placements um, and providing folk to, to support with that application process. And I'll give you a quick example from my time working um, in a mental health trust when I first left the army. Um, I uh, knew a lady and she contacted me and said, I'm interested in the NHS. Can I come and do a work placement? And it was all done before a lot of this fantastic work we're seeing now. Um, and she came in and she worked for us for a month. What we didn't do is have her following us around like a 16 year old work experience student. She, she was effectively a project manager in her own right and delivered a bespoke piece of work within that four weeks. She got a lot from that because she had a responsibility. Um, we got a lot from it. She wasn't needy. Look at what Billy's done in his first week. Um, and, and actually she delivered an awful lot and had a good look at the NHS and is working in the health sector now. So, so those are the sorts of things that we're asking you to do. Um, the next bit on that, that journey, if you like, number two, enhance your recruitment. Um, I've talked a bit about the Armed Forces Identifier. That, that's on, it, on NHS jobs at the moment, and about 218 trusts are using that, and you have to opt to use it. And the question is, are you a member of the Armed Forces community? Um, and as I mentioned, as a result of that, we know that nearly 4,000 applicants um, for jobs in the last quarter were from the armed forces community. Um, so, you know, that's, a, that, you know, that, that's a, a, another easy win. And I've mentioned a little bit about career fairs, um, insight days, etc. Then um, they're all enhancing activities, not mandatory for the college. Sort of moving on then to the next bit, creating a supportive work environment. Um, in terms of my own journey, I, I left the army once, I joined the NHS twice. There's a story there. Um, and um, there is a case that we need to better support transition. Um, and actually, if we need to be convinced of it, let's have a look at what other sectors are doing. The IT, the telecoms, finance sectors, they all do this really well and have got excellent transition support arrangements in place for veterans. Amazon does it brilliantly well. And they don't do that because they want to just support veterans. They do that because it makes business sense. Um, and actually retaining the veteran that you've managed to attract is really important too. Um, and so that would that would be my my point on there. Building an external network, uh, and we have seen it in this group here today. Um, your armed forces community personnel will help with that. There's nothing more passionate. Yes, there is. I've seen some of it today, but but there, there are very passionate folk from the veteran community who want to support other veterans um, on their journey going forward. And so they will help you to do that that building that external network. Um, and again, that's not altruism, that's about business sense. Um, and I hope that's sort of been made clear so far. And then finally on there, becoming an armed forces advocate. Uh, and again, um, I hope you can see that the value within your own armed forces community of uh, making that integration well. Before I finish, it's Mental Health Week and I wanted to make a point there. And thank you to Anna Maria at the beginning, who um, you know really bravely mentioned her own journey in there. Um, I'm going to tell you very quickly about mine, um, not for any other reason than it's Mental Health Week and actually we need to we, we need to push these messages out. I understand every journey is different. Um, I wanted to make a point um, that, that only about 1.3% of service personnel get medical discharge from the army. The figures are lower in the other two services and about a third of those have um, had mental health reasons as part of the medical discharge. I was part of that wounded, injured and sick community having suffered with depression after a really tricky tour in Afghanistan. Um, I would say getting a help in the army was hard. Um, I was quite senior and so it was quite quite tricky to, to kind of um, open up and speak about that. Getting help in the NHS was even harder and I hold my, um, uh, my hats off to all of those that have made that journey much easier to the Op Courage agenda um, and to the other work that's being done to make it easier for folk to access. And I want to really talk about recovery that I'm well, I function at quite a high level. Since that bout, I've, I've done an awful lot of things. Um, you know, secured some good jobs, set up my own business, achieved another level seven qualification, directed a music festival, run an Amdram group, you know, kind, kind of done stuff. So, so I haven't sat at home just being a bit sad. Um, I think I add value and I would like to think my team would already say that. Um, and I would say I still do the things that made me successful in my military career now, and I'm still the same person. 
So when we ask you as part of the veterans sort of community and, and supporting organisations, not just to disadvantage veterans, I would also say you might find there's some fantastic advantages to taking this on and to having us in um, the NHS um, and working alongside you. And that's all from me. Debs, that was that was incredible. And thank you so much for sharing your story today and, and the work that you're doing. It's it's inspirational. So thank you so much for joining us today. I, I'm sure all of us really appreciate it. Yes. So I would now like to pass you over to Catherine. Um, she's a registered nurse and she's the VCHA lead for the Northwest. But for, before she joined the team, she led the veteran awareness program within Stockport. Catherine has been handed an award by the Cabinet Office for the work that she's done in this area. So, Catherine, it's over to you for Manifesto 4. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Anna-Marie. I am Catherine Glass, uh, the Regional Lead for the VCHA for the North West. I have a 29-year NHS career in a variety of different backgrounds. So I'm here to talk about uh, Manifesto number four with you. Um, if you could flick onto the next slide, Guy, please. And that's about the hospital establishing links to appropriate nearby veteran services. So I'm going to talk to you today about East Lanks Hospital, who recently have joined 12 other accredited trusts across the North West. Um, and the 13 accredited trusts in total are now supporting nine other trusts as buddies to, to go through um, their accreditation programme. And that means sharing the knowledge, sharing the ideas, sharing the services, sharing their experiences. Um, next slide, please, go. So I'm going to talk to you about Healthier Heroes. Healthier Heroes was established in 2018 um, and it's a charitable homeless shelter for vulnerable veterans and it's the in the town of Burnley, Lancashire. And the aim of the shelter was to provide a real place of safety um, whilst an individualised plan of care and support needs were developed. So that means that there's a 12-week residential programme that Healthier Heroes run and they do lots of things within there. So lots of sports in there, mental health um, involvement and awareness in there. There's cooking classes. There's lots of um, team building things that run alongside sort of that individualised plan of care and support needs. And, and what they do is establish the veterans to, to live independently. So once they leave Healthier Heroes, they have got some local authority houses that they're moving to to start that road back to recovery and independence, supported by Healthier Heroes. Next slide, please, Guy. So what happened when Healthy Heroes was established, that lots of veterans across the country began to hear about this and arrived up at the, um, at, at the facility and of course they came from out of area and although the charity had really good li links with local authorities, the links to healthcare providers was really quite in inconsistent and the, the veterans were registered with, with a local GP practice on admission. However, some of their real complex physical and mental health needs needed to be met by secondary and mental health care providers. And this is where East Lancs Hospitals came on board and began to work really collaboratively with Healthier Heroes and the other social care and local authority providers um, to support these really vulnerable veterans within the area. Next slide, please, Guy. So there had been quite a number of attendances out of hours at the emergency department and the urgent care centres for a variety of different reasons by different veterans, which included mental health crisis, some real tissue viability problems that the veterans were presenting with, medication concerns, and these veterans presented over a really short space of time um, from the homeless shelter. And whilst they were in the department, I think a lady called Fiona Lan, who's a senior nurse from the, the clinical site coordination team, really noted this pattern had been going on and contacted the charity to discuss, you know, what the trust could do and how they could best support the veterans and the charity to ensure that each person received the right care at the right time in the right health centre and how the charity could really support homeless veterans that presented at the hospital. And this is how the partnership was formed um, with the local trust and the charity. Next slide, please, Guy. So there's Fiona. Um, she came together with Andrew, who runs Healthy Hero Heroes. And the first thing that they established was a direct contact number and a bleep number for the clinical site coordination team. 
The team's made up of, as you know, clinical staff that are on duty 24 hours a day. So that seemed the best point to start that contact because that bleep and phone is manned all the time. So what they do as a, as a clinical team is they offer a triage system and through that they're able to signpost to the most appropriate healthcare settings. And that ranges from, from immediate um, assistance, so ambulances are sent by our MWAS, emergency department and urgent care consultations that can be facilitated by that clinical site coordinator without having a veteran to wait in a busy emergency department. Uh, mental health agreed pathways. So at this point, Lancashire Care, the mental health provider, was brought along in there to work with East Lancashire Health and the veterans to agree some pathways um, and again to look at how mental health crises can be best managed for the veteran and for the trust in the most appropriate setting. Um, and interestingly, the tissue viability nurses were brought in at this point as well because at this time there were some real issues with um, pressure ulcers that the veterans were presenting with from different parts of the country. So what it's done is really worked well in the fact that it's identified early symptoms um, and we can sort of get that help, they can get that help to the veteran where they need to be in the right time via a telephone call and they can be signposted without having to know they're going to need to wait or the stress of wondering where they're going to go next. Um, next slide, please, Guy. So the pathways and processes quickly widened out to involved people. Um, and it worked, the trust has worked really hard. It's just recently become accredited and has worked really hard on the early identification of veterans in their workforce and the early signposting of services to their ex armed forces patients within the trust. So in, in turn, what they can do with some of the vulnerable veterans that come in or the homeless veterans is they then refer into Healthy Heroes um, and if they are homeless then they can work on securing a place for discharge and if they, they are not homeless then the, the charity have now established a 12-week programme that is offered to non-residents and they do things um, as I've said earlier around um, social skills, they do CV writing, they do um, trips out, fishing, cooking skills, all the sorts of things that um, social skills that some of these vulnerable veterans need to move on to the next stage of their life. Um, next slide, please go. So the key to success is partnership without a shadow of a doubt. What you see on the screen now is displayed throughout the hospital at East Lines. It talks about uniting, inspiring and believing. It, you'll see the partnership logos on there for the charity and for um, East Lancs hospitals and at the bottom although it's not particularly clear there are some contact details there are some links there for veterans that are in hospital these are in the inpatient areas they're in the outpatient areas and they're down at Healthier Heroes what they've also done is linked in with the local TILS team under the umbrella of Ops Courage so what's happened is there's been a real network established of links from the Mental Health Trust from the acute trust that also incorporates community services from some of the volunteer sectors, some of the charitable organisations and these links have grown and have been embedded into practice by both the acute and community trust and by the mental health trust and some of the charities as well. Next slide please go. I think that, that's me done. I'm really happy to answer any questions in the chat box or at the end um, in regards to the stuff that's going on up at East Lancs, should you wish to find out more. Thank you. That's incredible. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, so next, um, we will be listening to Keith from the Queen Alexandra Hospital in Portsmouth. So Keith is a veteran, having served 15 years in the Royal Navy, and he is also a registered nurse. So his role is the Armed Forces Covenant Lead Nurse, Trust Lead Recruiter of the Armed Forces Community, and he's on the panel for the Employer Recognition Scheme Silver Award. Keith will also be speaking later, but for now it's over to you, Keith, for manifesto number five. So good morning, everyone. Thanks very much, Anna-Marie. Um, 
and as Anna Marie knows me well, I, I like talking and I tend to talk a lot about this because I'm so passionate about it. But my slides are going to be deliberately direct and short, as will be my speaking, or at least I'll try to, so that we can try and give you more time at the end of the masterclass for Q and A. Um, brief introduction um, to add to what uh, Anna Marie said. Yeah, 15 years Navy and served. Um, in the second Iraq conflict, just a couple of miles off the Iraqi coast on our medical facility afloat. And I've uh, been nursing for over 30 years. And like some of my colleagues have said, a um, couple of years ago, I also, in old money, had a nervous breakdown. And during that time, discovered that I also had mental health issues from serving in Iraq. So I've been also through the system, I've come out the other end, a much better person and uh, not that I like to blow my own trumpet at all, but I do feel very proud of what I've achieved in this new role that we're sort of trailblazing. So with training, I've kept it very short and sweet, as you can see, but it's important to have a baseline uh, of a presentation. I tend to use PowerPoint. Um, because without the, the training element, you can't educate your staff. Um, and it's about making them aware as well, because a lot of them, I, I will go around doing this training and I will visit areas like NICU and paediatrics. And in the early days, they would say, well, why have you come to speak to us? We, we deal with babies, we deal with children. They didn't understand that, yes, but don't you have, ch have children with military parents? Oh, we never thought of that. So they, they just they don't know that help and support is there for the families as well as for those in uniform. So this is what the, the, the presentation, the training is all about. Um, I've also, because of COVID, um, I've also included um, narration so that as part of the trust induction, because this presentation is part of trust induction, um, they can actually hear my voice. So not that, you know, not everyone likes to hear my dulcet tones, but it does actually, it's the next best thing to sitting in the room with me and getting the full presentation. So whether you want to use narration as well, that's entirely up to you until we can get back to our face-to-face -face training. Um, and it is really important as Professor Briggs said at the beginning about mentioning the families, because I do actually feel that the families, if you can go, you're going too fast, sorry, with the slides. <laughs> um, go back to the graph, please. Um, and it's important to include the families because I feel that they actually um, suffer more. They actually um, give more than a lot of the those in uniform because they're supported. The families left behind could be single parents with no friends, no family. So it's all about supporting them as well. So it's all about trying to make the people you speak to, make them aware of the military culture and what we do. Um, now, this slide here is just really showing you that back in April 19, right back at the beginning, this is where, and this is no disrespect to my trust at all, we signed the covenant and like some places, we pay, pay lip service. We just sign, you know, tick the boxes and we sign the covenant, but don't actually put any action in place. Um, then I came into role unofficially as a secondment. And as you can see, with the aid of training, you can see the, the gray there, which is the total numbers uh, that I've recorded because this is to do with the actual attendances to ED and veterans that have been identified as inpatients. You can see the numbers have, have sort of spiked. This is not to say that we've got more veterans, it's just that we've become better at identifying them and uh, recording them, flagging them on our system as veterans. So this is proof that doing actual awareness training, educating the staff, um, and asking the question, have you ever served? Not, are you a veteran? Um, I never ask patients, are you a veteran? And there's a reason for that, but I never ask that question. I always ask, have you served? Uh, or have you been in the military? Questions like that. So that proves that point that um, we're actually making a good job. The dip there is due to COVID. 
but then we're slowly starting to uh, to ramp up again. Um, next slide. So again, it's all to do with communication. We've heard from our colleagues as well about communication um, and effectiveness. This is the um, my uh, website that I've created. Thankfully, my trust allowed me to manage it myself, so I keep it very up to date. You can see there's four Zoom virtual chat rooms at the top. So one is for general questions, for educating the general public that might be saying, oh, I'm coming into hospital next week. I'm a veteran. How should I expect to be treated? Or, or what? how should it change? If you can go back, please. Um, thanks, Anne-Marie. And, um, and then you've got others for recruitment, because I like to engage with them. So one is for the recruitment. So it's a virtual chat room and I have all of the vacancies for the trust. I get a report every week so they can actually see, I can engage with them and ask questions about joining the trust if they're just about to transition out of the military. I've also got a chat room for the spouses and partners of current serving. And then the last one is a new initiative. Professor Briggs said about the military being at the older end of the veterans being at the older end of the age spectrum. This has um, come about from a very quick and dirty audit I did where we discovered that 25% of our uh, veterans, uh, sorry, 25% of patients in our inpatient population who have got diagnosis of dementia are veterans. So I'm linking in with our lead dementia nurse and doing some initiatives around that since it's dementia week next week. So we're doing that as well. So it's all about um, educating, about training, about awareness, um, and, uh, and that's about it. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Keith. And uh, sorry about the slides and the mouse. We have a runaway mouse situation happening here. <laughs> Um, so now we're going to hear from Jane um, from East London Foundation Trust and Jane is a registered mental health nurse and is the clinical lead for recovery and clinical lead for veterans at ELFT. Um, Jane is incredibly passionate about the work being undertaken for the armed forces community within London and I'm pleased to say they're going to be submitting their application for the VCHA accreditation this month. So Jane, it's over to you my love. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Um, just a quick introduction, really. Um, thank you for, for that, um, Anne-Marie. So I'm Jane Kelly. I am a nurse. I've been a nurse for 30 years. I'm not a veteran. Um, but I was brought up by my granddad, gorgeous painter and decorator from Liverpool, who was a very quiet man, a very funny man. He taught me how to sing and he taught me how to swear. Uh, but my granddad was a veteran from the Second World War and I know he saw some terrible things and was involved in some terrible things. But he came back to Liverpool, raised his family uh, and was a painter and decorator. So I did it for him because he was a great man. But I work for East London NHS Foundation Trust and we're massive. We cover all inpatient community service across City of London, Newham, Tower Hamlets and Hackney, but we also cover all the mental health and community services across Luton, Bedford and Central Bedfordshire. So we're a massive organisation which has made the awareness and the communication and getting the stories out there particularly difficult. So I'm the clinical lead. Um, I also am the clinical lead for recovery for the trust. So I manage the recovery colleges uh, and I do a lot of work about stigma and discrimination in mental health. Uh, part of my dyad is Dr. Paul Galuli, who's our chief medical officer for the trust. Uh, and he provides really the exec sponsorship uh, to the Veterans Alliance. Uh, so next slide, please. So we started about 18 months ago and then we got sidetracked with COVID and other, other things uh, like most NHS trusts have done. But I have to say, despite that, staff have really, really engaged with this project, despite a lot of staff being redeployed, a lot of staff working overtime, staff shielding. And also remember that a lot of, a lot of our staff have lost uh, over the last year or so. 
uh, hats off to them that they've remained engaged with this project. And some staff have actually said through the pandemic, they found this a real comfort blanket to be involved. So the first things we have to do being such a big organisation is really try and tap into the staff who are passionate about the Veterans Alliance. Uh, and we just put it out there. We just ask people. Uh, we ask staff, were they veterans, were they reservists or was there a personal connection? Uh, and we had a lot of staff across the organisation get in touch to say they wanted to be involved. We also advertised across the organisation in our different boroughs in the local media, asking the veteran communities uh, if they wanted to be a veterans champion and be part of the alliance. And they are paid roles within the trust uh, that people can apply for uh, so they get paid for the work that they do. We also linked in with our partner organisations. And I think this was the biggest surprise for me personally, because I started this project thinking there was going to be a massive gap in what's available for veterans and I really was not aware just how much fantastic work is happening out there um, and I think that's the issue we have uh, within the NHS is that we're just not aware of what's available so we've really linked with our partner organisations and they're part of our alliance um, so the British Legion, the Poppy Factory, um, we have were registered with Step Into Health, all call signs are now on board, which are amazing. Uh, and it just grows and grows and grows. Um, we've got connections with Forces Connect app um, and the Veterans Gateway. So we have really tried to, to network uh, and we've got our own web page where we advertise and we signpost and we put all our links uh, and all these services there. We also wanted to look at our internal departments. So ensuring that we had people in our alliance meetings from communication and we had a separate communication strategy. Uh, also uh, the training department to look at things like our induction training package, uh, online training uh, for staff to do. Uh, we did a quick survey and asked staff how would you like uh, training around the veterans and they want one, they want face to face training uh, and we're going to do that co produced with, with our veteran community. But in the interim, we are going to do some online training as well, just because of the virtual world we live in, but also how, how big the organisation is. But we want a blended approach to that. We're not going to do veterans awareness training online purely because uh, I think that misses the point, but it will be an add-on to some face-to-face. -face. We've also had uh, engagement with our HR department. Uh, one of our staff is a veteran in the, in the recruitment department, and again, he's very passionate about this uh, and is leading on our accreditation uh, for the Defence Employment Recognition Scheme. We've applied for our bronze. Uh, but we're really confident we can get there quite quickly. We, we, we've done a lot of work around that. And we also have within East London Foundation Trust a really solid quality improvement programme. And this, the Veterans Alliance, we've now registered as a triple aim project because of the complexity. And we've only had one meeting so far, but we've got our driver diagram. Uh, and we've got our aims and we've got our projects. And I think the most important thing for me in that is that we have our measurements and we want to use our data um, in a quite sophisticated way to show the improvements that we're making uh, and embedding them into practice. Um, we've just, the trust is just doing their wave 10 of the improvement a leaders programme, which is a five day, quite intense quality improvement programme. And I was really pleased that we had the regional lead from the Poppy Factory. Uh, we got one veteran's wife, one veteran and myself all engaged doing that programme now. And that's my my project board for the Triple Aim. And, and it just shows a partnership work. And I think that will that really helped drive this forward. Uh, can I have the next slide, please, Anna? So I think that it was the raising awareness took a couple of strands and having worked in the NHS for over 30 years and trying to implement change throughout that, 
I think it's always important to think about three things really uh, about how staff engage. And I think one, we have a cohort of staff who really want to know the legislation. They need to know that this is a must do. We've signed the covenant. We will hold you to account. And there's some staff who will do stuff because they're told to do it and it's legislation and we're going to um, test them against that and hold them to account. So we really wanted to make sure that we let staff know that we have signed the covenant, the legislation is coming on board um, and this is what we must do to ensure compliance. The majority of our staff, though, will do things for the right reasons, and that's usually because they hear the narratives from our veterans community. And we've um, put quite a few stories on the intranet, and we're going to do some um, short blogs uh, now with SAFE to meet in person and do some filming. And I think the actual narratives from our veterans community is the one thing that will drive this change forward. It's it, it's the one thing that when staff hear and read that motivates them to do better. We also have a lot of staff that I call our professors. They want the research, they want the methodology and they want the statistics and they want to show that it's working. So I think it's really important that we publish our, our triple aim uh, results on a regular basis um, and we've registered registered it now so people can see that so that was really important as well to show people that we are making improvements and how we're going to measure that and how we're going to what change ideas we're going to try uh, and if they don't work we'll try something else um, so we have our trustwide intranet which is an internal communication and they do regular updates and reminders We've also got our web page ready to go, just a couple of tweaks on some of the photographs I wasn't too happy with, but that's been totally co-produced with members of our Veterans Alliance uh, and we don't make any changes to that without running it by them first. We are going to do our training awareness video uh, when we can safely do that filming. We've got the narratives, we've got the scripts, uh, we just need to meet up and do that, so we'll be getting that done soon. We also want to make sure that all our reception and outpatient departments, now our doors are opening more, uh, have the posters up uh, to, to let people know that we're interested and let people know that we'd like them to identify if they are a member of the veteran community. We've got several uh, veterans champions now and you all want badges. I think everybody wants a badge. Uh, so we're going to get some badges designed and, and get out there. And I think, again, that's really important. And and, and backdrops as well, you know, um, to ensure that we have back, backdrops and we have it on our email signature and, and just kind of the subtle approach to getting the message across in the organisation. So the kind of raising awareness has really been from my surprise, uh, initially, just how much was available and how much we're letting veterans down by one, not asking them and identifying them, and then not having a greater knowledge and an understanding of what's available uh, throughout uh, our directorates to, to support them in a better way with both their mental health and physical health care. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Um, and it's been amazing working with you and your trust, um, working all veterans and the armed forces communities. It's, it's been an absolute joy. So thank you for presenting today. Um, I'm going to pass you over again to Keith, um, who's going to talk about one of the trickiest areas that I've found working with some of the trusts, and that is the identification of veterans. So over to you, Keith. Thanks again, Anna Marie. Um, yeah, I'll, uh, next slide. Uh, so some of my colleagues have already sort of broached this and said this, so our apologies for echoing this, but the hardest thing is the identification because, as one of our colleagues has said, some ex-militaries, some veterans don't want to be identified, and that's their choice. Um, but also in an acute hospital setting like we have in Portsmouth, we're all very busy, um, not using staffing as an excuse, but sometimes, you know, the, for them to remember to ask every single patient, have you served your country? Have you been in the military? Sometimes it's not high on their priority. So with this awareness training, again, it's about getting that importance across to them to ask them that question. 
because it does have a direct impact on their health and well-being and how long they stay in hospital as well. Um, because I do have evidence that by getting us involved, it can make a huge difference to the length of stay of a patient and has financial um, ramifications as well. So how do we identify a veteran direct referral? So from the community, they have what we call SNOMED codes. I'm trying and um, hitting my head off a brick wall a little bit. We're, we're trying to simplify these codes because there are so many and trying to get a lot of the GPs practice, the, the community um, allied health professionals to use simple codes to identify them so when they're being referred into hospital these codes are recognised by the hospital and get onto our PAS system. Depending on what version of PAS you have this can be a challenge. The software has got a huge um, issue, a huge impact here. Patient self-identifying, so again with posters that I've got plastered all over the hospital, again if I can't get the staff to remember to ask the question, I put posters up for the patients to remind them, have you served? If so, speak to somebody who's wearing the Veteran Aware badge. So I'm trying to tackle it from both directions. Um, so that's that's uh, one way of, of using the training and the advertising. Registration and assessment is more to do with pre-op assessment. So when patients come in, um, for surgery, for example, it can be part of that uh, questioning that they've served so that by the time they are to come in for the surgery, it's already been documented. The hospital's already aware that they um, are a veteran. I've tried to sell this to my IT department like an allergy. You know, once you've got an allergy, you've got it for life. You know, it, it makes me chuckle sometimes when they say, oh, you're you're an ex-veteran. No, I am a veteran. I'm an ex-military. Um, there's no such thing as an ex-veteran. Once a veteran, always a veteran. Comes up in conversation. You know, you, you see you know, a patient with a, a tattoo, you know, with a nice big anchor. Well, you wind them up and say, that's a nice army or RAF tattoo you've got. And then that gets the banter going. So there's ways around asking the question. But just in conversation, this is why... If you can, your portering staff, you know, get them through some training because they're the ones that will move patients on their beds, their chairs, take them to x-ray. And sometimes there's a delay in that they can have that friendly banter and, and, have, and identify that they're a veteran. And then if the ward doesn't know, when they return the patient, they can say, oh, you did, have you flagged them up as a veteran? You know, so it's all about this identification and advertising, as I've said, posters, so that if patients do come in, they can let you know that they're a veteran as well, if they wish to. Next slide, Anna. So what we have devised, and this is um, Bedview, that is a live system, um, and um, it is a system that we've designed in the hospital. And it is basically a patient flow bed management system, a live system, and very, very easy to use for what I need it to do. And basically, as you can see there on the right hand side, there's a status summary. So all I need to do is hit that. And then on the next slide, it will show you the next screen, which I've taken a, 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 sort of a snippet of. And obviously, there's a lot more details, but obviously, I've anonymized it. Um, and the second in from the left, it says, please select flag. So when you hit that, the next slide will show you the screen that you're presented with. And you've got all these flags. And that's from identifying dementia, falls risk, you know, a whole variety of which you can see at the bottom right, veteran. So this is all the staff have to do is flip that switch to say they're a veteran. Then I can pull up this report in this slide. Yes, it says 20 patients, so that's how many last week I had on that particular day, but I've just taken the headings so you can see the information that we get. And then I can go into this live system and I can get an update on everything about the patient, their estimated discharge, if they're fit for discharge, what's done. I, it's a whole live system. So this is fantastic for me. What we're working on at the moment is that we've just gone to a digital assessment system so when we are doing activities of daily living and admitting patients, it's now digital. And when 
one of the questions under um, activities I deal with in one is have you ever served? Do you serve? Does a direct family member serve or have served? And that's a mandatory question. And if we answer yes to any of those, this flag switch to say they're a veteran automatically flips across so we can get the information more accurate to who our veteran community is or our military community is. So we can only support those we know about. That's the problem. Um, this is a different screen. I'm not an end user for Oceano, but Oceano is a third party programme, national, and that is for ED. So I also get reports and we can record the military community uh, for those that then attend ED. So that's the sort of systems that we use to identify. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Keith, and uh, apologies for looking forward too fast. It's not you, I promise. We do want to hear from you. <laughs> um, so now we're going to hear again from Catherine, and she's going to be discussing our final manifesto point, and she's going to be talking about the incredible veterans passport. So thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Anna. I've lost my slides. Perfect. First slide, please, Anna. So previously to being seconded into this post, I was part of the patient experience team at Stockport Hospital. Um, if you could flick on to the next slide for me, Anna. And um, what happened in July 2018, we, we received a complaint in, um, and we responded to that complaint and it basically said that um, this patient was fighting on the battlefield and fighting the NHS to get the sort of care and treatment that he needed. Um, next slide, please, Anna. So we responded to that and we asked the person to come in and sort of explain to us what his issues was. So on the screen you see Dan. Dan is, um, was a 35 year old veteran of five operational tours. Dan experienced some really complex um, orthopaedic injuries, blast injuries. He was blasted 40 feet from his vehicle and um, lives with very complex PTSD. A byproduct product of his complex PTSD is that it affects his endocrinology system. And every six to eight weeks, he comes through our outpatient department for blood tests and a medication review for his testosterone levels. What Dan was encountering in his visits was that inconsistency of seeing different clinicians, having to repeat his story, and really was having such a poor experience every time he came through the hospital that the effect of that was that he would either come and leave before his time to go in, he would come and be really agitated when he got in to see the consultant and really distressed at having to repeat his story, or he wouldn't attend clinics at all. So working with Dan, we asked him what would aid that for him, because realistically I can't give you the same consultant, nursing staff, reception staff, I can't promise that every time you come to one of our clinics. And Dan asked us to think about um, a passport for him. So we sat down with him and we planned what we were going to do. Um, and we developed the passport to, to health and social care. And at that time, sort of, we looked as a patient experience team around the organisation to see what it was we did for veterans. Dan was quite right, we did nothing at all. So on, on track with this, we sort of developed a roadmap to success. And at the start of the roadmap, the first thing that we did was we signed up to the Armed Forces Covenant because at that point we weren't signed up to that. We filmed Dan's story so Dan kindly agreed to share his story with us and I used that through the patient experience platform and I took his story along with Dan and the passport across to our trust board to get that real high level buy-in from the executive team to drive forward this um, project that we were undertaking. So we produced that first draft. And then what we did is sort of shout out to um, our trust staff. And Keith, you are quite right. The biggest drivers of this project across at Stockport were our portraying teams, our domestic teams and our healthcare teams. They are the people that are on the shop floor that will identify the veterans for you. Um, so we we developed, um, we established an armed forces support working group and we all came together with a willingness to succeed with this project. Um, next slide, please. 
So what did we do? We did several scoping um, exercises around the hospital to see what people knew about the armed forces community, what they knew about veterans, what they knew in general around any of the forces, and it was very, very little. So at this point, we engaged with the Royal British Legion and some other external people, sort of local charities that were looking after veterans in the Stockport area, SAFA, um, just to sort of say, from a training perspective, what did we need to do to showcase um, that we were sort of on the road to enable this? So one of the things that we did to start with is that we quite rightly um, made, had a postal displayed. You can see the banner there, Veterans Passport to Health and Social Care. It asks on that, have you or your spouse or family member ever served in the armed forces? So we got lots of these printed, laminated, and we put these up in really key areas. Now, the so what from that was what next? So then we began a really rigorous programme to educate our staff. We started with the frontline staff that would be asked the question in these areas, and they were the receptionists and the administrators. So we sort of worked with our IT services to establish how we were going to identify veterans. It needed to be really meaningful. If somebody was going to come along and identify themselves as a veteran or pick up a passport that were around the hospital, they were scattered around the hospital in various places, then that needed to be a meaningful connection. We wanted every um, every contact to count. So we did display the posters, but on the back of there, we sort of displayed a crib sheet of what to do. We incorporated a code into PAS that when trans put into the PAS system, when somebody came into hospital, then flicked over very similar to what Keith alluded to, onto our system, which was the Vantis Ward, and we chose a poppy symbol for ease of um, education, really, because all our staff knew what a poppy was. So if you were an outpatient, the code would flag up. If you were an inpatient, the poppy symbol would come up. Um, and that identified our veterans in our hospital beds at that time. So the what next is we'd started gathering what we needed for education. We started then, next slide, please. To, to begin some liaisons with GP practices, with veteran groups, it was really important if we were going to look at what services we needed, that we engaged with the veteran community to find out actually what did they want. Um, there wasn't any point thinking about improving services that would be meaningless to the veterans. So we started that process of engaging with a variety of veterans groups. Um, and quickly realised that we needed to involve, we engage ourselves with external partners coming from a, a patient flow background. I understood it's that once somebody leaves hospital, it's the what next there. Um, so we did that. We started to engage with our local police community. Um, the picture you see at the bottom on the right is us at the Armed Force Coven Group for the local council. So we picked up in that group connections with housing, connection with job centres, connection with um, social prescribers right across the borough that would help us then with the next stage of the veterans journey when they left our hospitals. Uh, next slide please Anna. So then we did exactly what it says on there. We showcased what we were doing. We told people what we were doing. We were telling people that we are becoming a veteran friendly hospital. Um, and to ask for things when they came in. We did a big educational programme with the staff and that included some really simple seven minute briefs, some tips that we'd got from the external people that were working with us, Royal British Legion, SAPA, some real quick fixes that staff could look for. We displayed them in all the staff areas, every um, corridor, every staff room, they were displayed in there. So what we'd got at this point is we'd got the posters up the posters were displayed in every patient facing area. And you're right when you said earlier, Keith, it is a big responsibility for staff to ask the question constantly because there are so many competing demands on um, our staff's workloads. So by displaying the posters, we got the veterans that wanted to to identify themselves to us. So we, we, we mirrored that with um, a similar thing for the staff that made staff aware of things. We filmed a short, a really short video that ran hand in hand with Dan's story that is shown at corporate induction. And that is just to raise that awareness. We then begin began to show Dan's story along with that 
at corporate inductions and different opportunities um, throughout the trust. So some of these things went on to the staff safety huddles in clinical areas. They went across and were shared at teams meeting for the non-clinical staff. Um, and once we'd done that, we began to showcase across the wider Greater Manchester what we were doing. Some of the passports at this point began to appear in neighbouring hospitals and we'd put a contact phone number on the back of the passports for people to give us a call and we explained what it was about. So by, by doing this and starting raising the profile, we actually uh, were nominated and won a place for uh, a stand at the Greater Manchester NHS Providers Conference. And we took the things that we were doing down there and really showcased um, the effort that we were making to try and become um, not only a veteran friendly hospital, but a very good one as well. So some of the things that, if you could flip to the next slide, Anna, some of the things that we did internally is that we did a review of our documentation for admission and we added the question onto our nursing documentation. So we'd got that embedded into um, the culture of an admission. We also did an awful lot of work with the discharge team. and They then became embedded into the admission culture. So at the point of admission, our discharge team identified veterans and we could begin to work towards some of the complex discharges or even just signposts, just places like breakfast clubs um, and other little charities that were going around sort of up in, you know, if I think of one that particularly was prevalent, we used men's sheds and they sort of helped out with um, that social aspect after discharge for people that may not have um, a great deal of um, social and support network around them. So nationally, this was picked up and in January 2020, I presented the work that we'd done at Stockport down at the National Leadership Forum for the Cabinet Office. Um, so that for us was a real pivotal point. We'd been identified as veteran friendly, we've been accredited by this and we were still continually and continue to this day to look at the pathways and processes. It's an ever moving feast. Um, but I'm just going to share with you now some of the ways in which the Veterans Passport to Health and Social Care has helped some of the veterans that have come through our doors and not come through our doors. Um, next slide, please, Anna. So I'm going to really briefly talk to you about Graham. Um, Graham was a 39 year old gentleman who frequently attended our ED department and neighbouring hospitals ED departments with a history of alcohol abuse. He very frequently left the department without being treated. Um, he was known to the local police. On one occasion, he was found wandering down the road in his trousers and just a hospital wristband. Very frequently into custody with some of the offences relating, relating to his alcohol abuse. Um, and unbeknown to us, on one of his visits, he took a passport from the display area uh, in the waiting room. He was admitted to a neighbouring hospital and gave the staff there his completed passport, who then contacted us and we began to work together around his discharge plans. I then contacted the, the, the police liaison uh, support officer that, that supported Graham and we began working with Graham and it really became evident through the passport that Graham was homeless and had been homeless for um, several months. He'd done some sofa surfing, he'd slept out on the streets. So what we knew is from that point that he didn't have anywhere to go. So we contacted the local authority and the contact we had in there and collaboratively working with them, we were able to facilitate some temporary accommodation for Graham. So at this point, I contacted the Royal British Legion and they came, came on board as well. So we had four different lots of um, sectors working with Graham just to see if they could facilitate something um, to help Graham give, give up his wish for alcohol and, and they did that. So the local authority found him somewhere to stay and the Royal British Legion um, offered him support and they, they offered him a support worker. He then gained a place on the local alcohol rehab programme and to this day, from me finishing on the 31st of December in the nicest possible way, I have never seen Graham again in any of our ED departments. I've not had a call about him. His support continues. What he is now is very active in um, the breakfast clubs. Um, so for me, the things that were disclosed on the passport were things that we not picked up and I suppose our failings as NHS Trust were that we'd not delved deeply enough into answer the questions. 
um, which Graham gave us the answers to on, on a very simple passport. Um, next slide, please, Anna. So I'm going to talk to you now about Jack. Jack came in to us on the 21st of October. Previously lived at home, Jack had totally slipped through the net. He had no living re relatives um, around him. He lived alone. Um, he had a twice daily package of care and he'd come into hospital really quite unwell. He'd started on one of our respiratory wards and we'd started an active plan to look after him. Because we displayed poppy symbols not only on the wards um, system, but actually on the behind the bed boards. He actually asked one of the healthcare assistants, what's the poppy for? And she told him and she shared a passport with him and she completed the passport. And part of that completion was the fact that he expressed a wish that if he did become end of life, if he was not well enough to go home, that he really didn't want his final place to be in hospital with us. So what we were able to do at that time when it became end of life for Jack, his condition had deteriorated really rapidly um, and he was approaching his end of life care. So by understanding really what his wishes and needs were prior to, to, to this point, we were able to understand how important it was for him so again, um, Jack was, put, was found a place in the Royal British Legion residential care home and um, he was transferred there on Christmas Eve and he passed away very early, aged 101, surrounded by the band of brothers that were so important to him. Next slide, please, Anna. So the last gentleman I'm going to talk to you about is a gentleman called Nigel. Um, and we did a lot of work, as I've said, with other services around Stockport. We worked very closely with the, the homeless shelter in, in Stockport um, and they had passports down there. So Nigel um, never came to hospital, got his passport, introduced himself to a colleague and myself at an event that we were at and told us how he'd used his passport that he picked up from the homeless shelter. So Nigel used it to, to go to a benefits review and historically he had either not gone to benefits, which meant that his benefits would be suspended. He got himself really anxious about it and would worry about that right up to the time that he went to his appointment. His mental health would deteriorate. It would put him in that real vicious circle and invariably it would mean a suspension for his benefits, which would take a homeless shelter then to get a support worker to be able to reinstate them. On his last review, he took his passport with him now, because we'd worked quite collaboratively with um, the job centre, they were aware of the passport and they understand the meaning of it. And they've done some training down there with their staff. And when Nigel presented his passport, the worker that he presented it to knew what it was. So she read that and um, his appointment went very well. And in his words, it gave him confidence knowing that he was treated as a passport. So, so my last slide is just going to share with you some of the comments that have come back on some of the evaluations um, and the feedback around the passport from veterans that have used it in a variety of different settings. So it's provided me with a safety blanket. It's my voice when I can't speak. Nigel's quote is, it gave me confidence knowing I'd be treated as a person and my worries and fears are taken seriously when people read my passport and it's massively changed my life. Um, thank you Anna, that's the end of my presentation. Again, I'm happy to answer any questions around the things that we did at Stockport and um, any questions going forward. I'm happy for you to have my email address and we can pick them up outside of this meeting. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much for that, Catherine. And all of Catherine's details, as well as every speaker from today, will be distributed to everybody in the supplementary pack, as well as the recording of this presentation. And I'll include timestamps if needed so that you can go to the section that you you'll get the most benefit from. So I just want to say thank you so much to all of the speakers today. I, I really, really appreciate um, all the work that you've done. Um, and especially the last presentation, Catherine, those case studies, whew, they always they always get me, especially Jack's story. So so thank you to everybody today. Guy. Yeah, no, um, thanks, Anna Marie. Um, yeah, I, th I think um, th there is a little bit of time for questions if, if anyone wanted to ask any questions. Um, so if you want to just raise your hand, we've got 
you know, the assembled team here, um, please feel free to, to ask questions. Absolutely no pressure at all. Um, and, and you can maybe make contact with people directly afterwards. Any more hands? No, OK, well, that, that's good. Um, I think really what I wanted to say really in bringing the masterclass to a close that I want to thank all the speakers, um, some fantastic stories, uh, and I'm very humbled for what people actually do for the military community, and I, I continue to be humbled. Um, always invidious to single out individuals. Uh, Tim Briggs is a force of nature, and we are where we are in terms of veterans' health because of all the drive that as he's put behind his program, and, and it's really inc incredible, really. Um, I think the speakers have said you've made a massive contribution to manifestos one to eight, and I think that really has brought it to life, actually, um, them personal stories. Um, to any of the military community um, I, and all NHF staff, actually, you know, I, I do pay tribute to all of you. Uh, and, and thank you for your service. It, it's absolutely incredible. Um, and finally, Anna Marie put all this together. Anna Marie, on behalf of the speakers, the people here, thank you very much for putting together a fantastic sort of two hour session. I know you've been burning the candle at both ends, but you know that hard work has actually paid off. Um, I think certainly I'm better informed than I'm sure everyone else is. Um, I think the final plug, and you won't mind me for saying this, Anna Marie, uh, there is a national webinar for Veterans Government Healthcare uh, on the 21st of June, which is the start of Armed Forces Week. Um, we've got our patrons speaking, we've got Tim Briggs speaking, um, we've also got David Richmond um, speaking, um, we've got the Army Engagement Group doing some stuff, um, and then we've got some trusts really bringing some of them veteran stories to life um, and quite inspiring as well. Um, I think that's JJ Chalmers, who's ex Royal Marine, who, who does Strictly Come Dancing, uh, who was injured in Afghanistan, but he's got quite an interesting story. But that will be a fantastic sort of two hour session. So please put that in your diary. If you haven't seen the invite, bang me an email and I'll send it. But uh, again, you know, Anna Marie, brilliant job. Well done. Um, to everyone else, thank you very much and uh, please uh, take care and stay safe.